How many mysteries seem to involve trees? A dark forest, a lone oak with an empty swing swaying in time with creeping music. Bible Sleuth here, and I'm on a case investigating a perplexing fig tree. Let's first go to the scene in Luke 13, one through three in the KJV. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He, being Jesus, spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth the, the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. This is an odd story, but why did Jesus tell it? And what could it mean? Well, to start, we should talk with these people who told him about the Galilean incident. And guess what? Luke didn't identify them. He said, there were some. The word used for some could be somebody or one person. I find it interesting that the King James says, there were present at that season some. Season, in this case, alludes to they picked that time as an opportunity to tell Jesus about Pilate. Was this another trap? I don't think so. Rather, it is probably a question born out of erroneous belief that when people suffer such things, they do so because they sinned. Jesus points out their error and dispels it, supporting it with his parable. This is his response to them. Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Jesus then adds, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And then, he went into the parable. The historian Josephus described Pilate's propensity for murderous seditions, but he offered no record of the Galilean massacre. There's some archeological evidence that supports a collapsed tower that fits the description of the Siloam incident. Regardless, Jesus used both events to address beliefs in erroneous fables. Were these judgments? No, but without repentance, all will perish. Judgment will come eventually, which today seems closer than ever as prophecies are being fulfilled. However, Jesus is the only way of escape. I admit that I came to this parable with a bit of bias, thinking that the vineyard owner was God the Father, Jesus the dresser in the tree, Israel. Jesus does fit the character because he still intercedes for people. Look at Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I've not heard this taught any other way, but recently I've been challenged in my interpretation. I also went into the wrong verse when I was looking up Romans 8, 34, and came across Romans 8, 22 through 23, where we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The words first fruit or fruit in general stood out and seem to have a common thread. We mustn't forget Jesus' statements about the Galileans and the Siloam Tower tragedies. They should remain in the forefront to find the meaning of the fig tree parable. So here's a question. Is there a time frame 
for one's tree to be cut down if the fruit of repentance is not evident. But let's go back to the parable and see what we can dig up. Jesus did say the owner had the tree planted and looked for fruit for three years. However, Jesus added a year for the tree to become fruitful. So what's the big deal? Fig trees take approximately three years to start bearing fruit. Following that, the tree will produce two to three crops in a year. Jesus didn't specify how long the tree was allowed to mature before the vineyard owner came seeking fruit. But it seems like he was keeping an eye out for that tree from the very beginning. Some say this was related to Jesus cursing the fig tree on the way to Jerusalem. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. If haply, he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. It seems harsh, right? Why did he do that? Fig trees produce fruit before the leaves are fully developed, and they have large leaves. This is the first of several crops in a season. A part chi, the first offering, which is where the rub begins because of Levitical law. So this particular tree was indeed barren that Jesus cursed because it was early, had developed leaves, but it didn't have figs. Some would say that Jesus' cursing of the fig tree symbolized the prophetic destruction of the Jewish nation, specifically Jerusalem. And I tend to think that is partly true. Since the fall of Jerusalem back in 70 AD, Israel was a desolate place until 1948 when they came back to the land as written in their Declaration of Independence. Since that time, the desert has blossomed, though it has taken a bit of time and effort. Spring has come to Israel, and summer is coming near, and we'll get on to that in a later episode. Were the parable and the curse of the tree related? I don't know. And leaning to no, especially since having my interpretation challenged. Regardless of what I'm about to say, the parable illustrates compassion for Israel, and not just Israel alone. Note too, that though he cursed the tree and it withered, Jesus was the one cut off, cast out, and became cursed according to Galatians 3:13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 21. But what about the plus one? I mentioned first fruit. What are considered first fruits? Leviticus 19, 23 through 25. When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years you are to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. I am the Lord your God. Notice the word forbidden. The word is ahrael, and in this context means to remain unharvested. So why would Jesus place God the Father contradicting Levitical law by eating forbidden fruit? He wouldn't, and I'm not sure Jesus is the dresser either, considering that to oppose the law was the opposite of his mission. He came to fulfill the law. That really holds a great deal of weight when we realize that as the second person of the Trinity, he was an author of the law. But wait a minute now. I find something interesting that was said by John the Baptist in Luke 3, 7 through 8. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Sound familiar? 
Well, what if the parable he told, and it's a big what if, but what if the story was familiar to the audience? Meaning it was a common fable or story possibly used to explain Leviticus to children wondering why they couldn't eat the fruit from a particular tree or vine. An example of such a fable was mentioned by the historian Josephus. The fable erroneously talks of Solomon's wisdom and spiritual abilities to exaggeration, illustrating how those fables turn to mystical beliefs. Paul said something about this in Titus 1. 13 through 14. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. You see, the fables did exist, and Jesus was obviously confronting these misguided theologies with the sum with regard to the two tragic events. Jesus also knew what John had said about repentance and possibly tweaked the story, accenting the Levitical law violation as a means of further confronting fable beliefs. Another view of the parable is the vineyard owner was a pagan and didn't care about the law wanting to eat the fruit anyway. The dresser probably planted and tinted the tree, knew the law and worked it to keep the law, and see that the tree be blessed as was promised. Going in a completely different direction, another perspective is that the vineyard owner is the nation of Israel, the fig tree, the individual Jew, and Jesus, the dresser and intercessor. I didn't realize how many interpretations there were of this parable. It's confusing. In fact, trying to fit this parable into a particular format or interpretation has only produced frustration. Ironic considering what Jesus was trying to do, huh? So what is important? First, there were beliefs fed by bad teaching and fables. Secondly, the lack of fruit and consequences are the major theme. It was obvious to everyone, including pagans, that a life will produce fruit and consequences for no fruit are similar. Lastly, the message of the law rings out. It may be probable that assigned roles for this was not the point. The overall theme was the point. So let's look at fruit since the lack of it seems to be speaking loudly. Going back to my mistake in Romans 8, 22 through 23, we see the phrase first fruits of the Spirit. Could this be related to the fruit of repentance? Remember, that the first fruit was holy, a sacrifice unto the Lord, given in the fourth year of the tree's fruit cycle. Some commentators say fruit of repentance is a lifelong process of turning away from sin and following after Jesus Christ, and I partially agree. However, I'm not sure that general explanation covers it all, especially in light of Romans 8, 22 and 23. Let's go back to John the Baptist. The people asked him, what they should do, of which his responses zeroed in on being selfless. Could this be the fruit? However, look at Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Possibly there is a connection between the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of repentance. Could it be that the fruit of repentance is goodness, righteousness, and truth? The word truth stands out, and according to Thayer, lexicon has multiple levels of definitions, but this stood out to me. What is true in things? Righteousness, integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So how does that compare to the fruit of the Spirit? That definitely sounds like goodness, righteousness, and truth, doesn't it? Galatians 5, 22 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. 
So the way I'm understanding this is, we are to crucify our flesh in Christ, and by doing so, the fruit of repentance, which is the sacrifice of the first fruits, then we'll see goodness, righteousness, and truth. The fruit of repentance, our lives will reprove unfruitful works of unrighteousness by how we live. The question is, how do we crucify our flesh? Galatians 5:16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Living and walking in the spirit allows us to produce and maintain fruit of repentance. And as we walk in the Spirit, the other fruit then will manifest themselves in our lives. Is this popular? No. But let's be reminded of what Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Given what we see in the world, and specifically in Israel and across the Middle East, it is crucial that we live in this way because the fig tree has blossomed and summer is coming as mentioned in Matthew 24.